Thursday, October 12th, 2017, Monaco 64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. So, very interesting subject I want to talk about today, uh, hedge funds and uh, the, whether, you know, hedge funds are the next big bubble to burst and while, whether hedge funds will bring the system down. You might think, oh, what are you talking about? But uh, yeah, before I do that, though, I'll just a quick rundown on the markets. It's 9.30 a.m. London. Uh, gold is uh, trading quite well. We've broken through 12.95. We're at 12.96.30, up five. Uh, the low has been 12.91. The high 12.98. Silver is at 17.24, up seven. Range has been 17.14 to 17.28. Uh, the Dow is down 12 points. Nothing really to write home about. S&P down three and a quarter points at 25.51. Crude oil down half a percent, but back above uh, 50. It's actually 51.18. The pound is a little stronger, 132.40, up uh, a tenth of a percent. Euro unchanged, 118.60, not much move there. And the dollar is weaker against the yen, 112.26, down uh, 0.2 of a percent. So now let's get to uh, hedge funds. First of all, I want to give you uh, my background for those of you who don't know my background, for new viewers or subscribers. I started... Uh, my career in finance in uh, Geneva, Switzerland, back in the late 80s. Uh, I moved to London in 1992, and I worked for uh, just over 20 years as a futures and options broker. Uh, my clients were institutional clients, so it wasn't a private client thing. And uh, when I started out, the Life Exchange, L-I-F-F-E, that was the one of the well, that was the biggest futures exchange outside the U.S. It was based in London. Uh, we even had a floor. Uh, you know, it was big, big thing. And I remember at the time, there's no such thing as hedge funds, or if there there were hedge funds, they're very, uh, you know, they weren't numerous and they weren't that big. And I even remember when I uh, started out uh, at ABN Amro because eventually. Uh, I used to work for Citibank uh, Futures Department, and they were uh, City Futures. They were bought out, bought out by ABN Emro, a Dutch bank, uh, specifically ABN Emro Futures. And uh, I was I knew a contact from uh, Salomon Brothers, and he was looking to leave and start his own hedge fund, and he wanted to actually uh, trade through ABN Emro Futures and through me. And he wanted to open what, what is called a give-up account, which is basically they keep their account, their main account, with another broker. But they can trade through uh, ABN Emerald Futures. And every time I do a trade, uh, execute the trade, I give it up to their broker. Um, but So I went to my uh, head of compliance you know, uh, to open the account. And they said, no, we don't deal with hedge funds. And this... To give you an idea, it was back in 1997. But nowadays, uh, hedge funds are, you know, all over the place. If you don't have hedge fund uh, clients, you're not going to do well. Um, so what are hedge funds? Basically, the easiest way for me to explain it to you is hedge funds are um, basically started by the top traders in the big investment banks or in the big banks. Uh, they decide that. They want to keep more of the profits they make for the bank. So they leave the bank and they start their own fund. Uh, a lot of times, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the banks they leave from are on a friendly basis with them. They give them actually money to look after, uh, to trade with. So it's basically almost like outsourcing uh, a trading department or a trader from a bank. And why is it good? Uh, why are so many of the top traders looking to start their hedge funds? Well, because there's a lot of money involved. And if you can have one or two good years, you're, you're made for life. And um, I had a few uh, clients at banks, traders, who started, you know, who went to work for hedge funds. That's always the goal of the, you know, the trader in the bank. And uh, why can they, uh, you know, after, why do I say after one or two years, they could be made for life? Well, it's because of their, uh, you know, fee structure, 
how they get paid hedge funds. Uh, basically, it's called two and 20. So for example, if you leave uh, a bank and you start your hedge fund and you have a good first year, maybe in the second year, you're going to get, you know, a billion dollars worth of uh, money to, to manage. And the 2% is a management fee paid every year, regardless of the uh, how the fund does. So you work it out. You know, you have $1 billion under management. You will get uh, $20 million in fees, no matter how well you do. And apart from that, though, they have a 20% profit uh, incentive. Basically, usually it means that if they have a return of over 8% a year, they will take 20% uh, of anything above that. So let's say they have a year where they make 20% on their assets, they'll get 20% of, uh, you know, 12%. So you can see how interesting and profitable it can be. You have one, two, three good years, and uh, you've got 50, 100 million dollars uh, in the bank. And uh, so that's how hedge funds work. And the thing about hedge funds, you might think they're hedged, that there's no risk, but of course there is. It's just a marketing ploy. Uh, they are highly leveraged. They work even, uh, they're even more leveraged than, uh, you know, the bank desks that they left. Uh, and you've probably heard of long-term capital management, which uh, Jim Rickards worked for back in the 90s. Uh, they almost brought the system down. In 1998, here according to Wikipedia, they lost $4.6 billion in four months following the 1997 Asian crisis. And the Federal Reserve had to bail out the system only because they lost $4.6 billion, uh, which is a lot of money and was a lot of money back then. But uh, the reason why it almost brought the system down is because a lot of these hedge funds you know, they have counterparties, uh, you know, brokers, they call them prime brokers, investment banks. They love having these uh, hedge funds as clients and they lend a lot of money to them so they can leverage the trades. And uh, and the best the best of it is that the banks or prime brokers don't have to take the risk themselves. But if if the uh, you know, if things go badly, it it can affect the whole uh, of Wall Street, the whole of the city of London, and that's why the Fed had to bail them out for 4.6 billion, you know, after they lost 4.6 billion, because they were leveraged probably 30 or 100 to 1, I don't know exactly. So that's the, the fund that uh, Jim Rickards talks about he worked for. Uh, so why am I talking about hedge funds today? Well, I saw an article yesterday on Zero Hedge, and I know that Zero Hedge, uh, Sometimes they clickbait a little bit, but uh, this article um, caught my attention. It says, is Bridgewater a fraud? Here are the tro troubling questions posed by Jim Grant. So first of all, who is Bridgewater? Well, according to Wikipedia, Bridgewater Associates is an American investment management firm. They call it an investment management firm, but it's actually a hedge fund. Founded by Ray Dalio in 1975, the firm serves institutional clients including pension funds, endowments, foundations, and foreign governments, and central banks. So that's Bridgewater Associates. And uh, according to Zero Hedge, and I read here from Zero Hedge, it says, Jim Grant, author of Grant's Interest Rate Observer, first hinted last week that not all is well when it comes to the world's biggest hedge fund, Ray Dalio's 160 billion Bridgewater, and it puts in uh, parentheses, of which one half is the world's biggest risk parity juggernaut. Speaking to Bloomberg last week, Grant said he was bearish on Bridgewater because founder Dalio has become less focused on investing while the firm lacks transparency, transparency and has produced lackluster returns. So, uh, Jay, who is James Grant? Well, he's been uh, a, a writer and publisher for many years on Wall Street. Uh, Wikipedia says uh, the founder of Grant's Interest Rates 
uh, Observer, a twice monthly journal of the financial markets. Uh, he is the author of Money of the Mind, 1992, The Trouble with Prosperity, <clears throat> excuse me, 1996, and so on. And the other interesting thing, uh, it says, uh, in 2012, Ron Paul named Grant as his likely candidate for chairman of the Federal Reserve to replant, replace Ben Bernanke, whose term expired in 2014. And there's an article as well about uh, G James Grant or Jim Grant in the in Zero Hedge uh, in June this earlier in June this year, and it says Jim Grant explains the gold standard. Um, and he's criticizing a, a Wall Street Journal article about gold. And Grant says, a quote from the article, as if to clinch the case against gold and necessarily the case for the modern day stat status quo, Mr. Ledbetter writes, of 40 economists teaching at America's most prestigious university, including many who've advised or worked in Republican administrations, exactly zero responded favorably to a gold standard when asked in 2012. And he goes on to say, perhaps so, but zero or thereabouts likewise described the, describes the number of established economists, economists who in 2005, 6, and 7 anticipated the coming of the biggest financial events of their professional lives. The economists mean no harm, but if in unison they arrive at the conclusion that tomorrow is Monday, a prudent person would check the calendar. So yeah, I mean, I've been following James Grant, you know, for many years when I worked uh, in the city. Uh, I, I have not subscribed to his uh, uh, service. It's gotten quite expensive. And uh, so I don't really read his stuff anymore. I used to subscribe at work and my firm used to pay for it. So he used to talk mostly about interest rates, you know, about the bond market, which is uh, something very uh, important for financial markets. But he's become a bit more critical. He, he's uh, very uh, often on CNBC, on Bloomberg, and he's usually like a contrarian. And uh, so... And he calls uh, today's economists PhD economists, <laughs> which is quite interesting. So back to the article uh, about whether Bridgewater is a fraud. It's actually written for someone who works for James Grant, a guy called Evan Lorenz. And uh, these are the main points that he brings up about uh, Bridgewater uh, hedge fund. It says Bridgewater has directly lent money to its auditor. KPMG, to which KPMH's response is that these lending relationships do not, and I'm quoting, do not and will not impair KPMG's ability to exercise objective and impartial judgment in connection with financial statement audits of Bridgewater funds. All right. And it says Bridgewater has 91x employees working at its custodian bank, Bank of New York. And it says as well, these are the main points. Only two of Bridgewater's 33 funds have a relationship with prime brokers. Uh, prime brokers are the brokers, you know, that like to have hedge funds as clients. And it's surprising that only two of their 33 funds have relationships with them. And it says in, in these two funds, Bridgewater Equity Fund LLC and Bridgewater Event Risk Fund 1, LTD, 99% of the investors are Bridgewater employees. And it says as well, opaque ownership concerns. And I quote, two entities, Bridge Bridgewater Associates Intermediate Holdings LP and Bridgewater Associates Holding Inc. are each noted as holding 75% of more of Bridgewater. And he goes on to question further, why the massive and expensive ETF holdings? So basically, he's, you know, apparently 87% of their holdings and equities are through ETFs. And he asked the questions, surely the Bridgewater Brain Trust could replicate the ETFs at a fresh fraction of the cost that the street charges. And then he goes on to say another uh, troubling point, and perhaps most troubling is the SEC in uh, he questions whether the SEC is in cahoots with Bridgewater. And he goes on to ask, 
Oh, and and I quote here, uh, Lorenz uh, asked the SEC how Bridgewater's answer comply with the requirement to provide your fee schedule. He asked that via email, and the uh, SEC replied to him, decline, decline comment, thanks. So basically, you've got here a serious uh, accusation from a very respected uh, publication, uh, James Grant's Interest Rate Observer, uh, against a huge, the biggest hedge fund out there, very well connected, uh, has, uh, as I said earlier, they have funds that are sovereign wealth funds, uh, pension funds, endowments, governments, central banks, and he's questioning whether there's something fraudulent behind, behind this. This is quite serious, in my opinion. Uh, and the other point that I'd like to make is uh, he brings up uh, the fact that um, a lot of their employees are now working at the Custodian Bank, Bank of New York. And that's really interesting. You know, further in the uh, article, uh, it's more detailed and it talks about this relationship. And I'll go over it here. Oh, yeah, it says here, and I quote, uh, after reading that footnote, Lorenz ob observe oh actually it says it's in relationship the potential conflict of interest involving bridgewater's custodian and it said and i quote after reading that footnote lorenz observes an investor may take a measure of solace from the fact that the custodian of many uh, bridgewater funds is bank of new york mellon corporation the world's largest custodian bank an investor may let may take less comfort from the fact that many of uh, Boney or B O N Y employees working uh, on the Bridgewater account are in fact former Bridgewater employees. In December 2011, Bridgewater signed a deal with Alexander Hamilton's old bank. Bridgewater fired 91 back office employees. Bank of New York hired these 91 practitioners of radical transparency to work Bridgewater's books in an outsourcing contract. And when I saw that, I thought of a scandal uh, back uh, about two years ago. Uh, and I quote from the New, uh, New, York's, New York Times article, Bank of New York Mellon will settle currency trade case for $714 million. And I read, well, basically, I, I can explain the, uh, what happened because I remember looking at that. They're basically uh, get, giving, uh, you know, clients, institutional clients, pension funds, you know, they were giving them the worst possible foreign exchange rate, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, how can I say, to uh, if the clients had foreign holdings. So they basically screwed the clients on the uh, foreign exchange side of uh, uh, their holdings and they, they had to settle. Uh, it says here, Bank of New York Mellon will pay $714 million to settle accusations that it cheated government pension funds and other investors for more than a decade, federal and state authorities announced on Thursday. So does that mean that uh, I think Bridgewater is a fraud and that Bank of New York Mellon is helping them? No, I'm just giving you some facts here of what they've done in the past. They paid $714 million to you know, shut, close the case. Uh, I don't think anyone went, went to jail for it. But, uh, uh, and why am I talking about this now? Well, you can just, it could be the next snowflake, as Jim Rickards talks about, that gets the system imploding. Uh, you know, back in 1998, 4.6 billion losses for uh, uh, LTCM. Uh, almost brought the system down. That's what Jim Rickard says. Uh, Fed had to intervene and, uh, you know, bail uh, the fund out. Uh, LT, you know, Bridgewater Associates, $162 billion under management. Uh, it could do a lot more damage. And the other thing as well that uh, Lorenz talks about is that uh, Bridgewater uh, is very secretive and they don't want to talk about the, you know, their financing needs, 
And he asks the question, why does a hedge fund that's worth $160 billion uh, need financing? Well, they do because they're highly leveraged. It's, it's like, a, you know, it looks good, the $162 billion, but how much have they leveraged that to? To the power of you know a lot like LTCM. So I just wanted to. Uh, am I saying that Bridgewater is a fraud? No, I'm just bringing up this article because I think uh, you know from Zero Hedge and you know originally from James Interest James Grant Interest Rate Observer uh, respected uh, respected uh, publication against a respected hedge funds. Uh, that deals for foreign governments and central banks. This could be huge, in my opinion. And I'll put the, the links to uh, articles below in the description. So if you enjoyed this video, please like, share it, and subscribe to my channel if you haven't yet. If you'd like to make a donation, there's a, I've got a Patreon account, a Litecoin address, Bitcoin address, PayPal, uh, all below in the description. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter and uh, on uh, steamit.com as well. And I'll talk to you later. Bye.